Hey, everybody, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. We're talking about Christian mysticism with Dr. Sam Storms and Michael Roundtree. It's going to be an exciting episode. You guys stay tuned. You are watching the Remnant Radio crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Got an exciting episode. We're talking about Christian mysticism. What exactly is it? Uh, what are the practices, the teachings, the doctrines, and what's the good, the bad, and the ugly of it? Today, joining me from the great state of Oklahoma, uh, most people won't actually believe that, uh, I've got Michael <laughs> Michael Roundtree and uh, Dr. Sam Storms. I'm representing he OKC is. because we got two OKCers. I'm, where are you at, Josh? Bro, you could have just joined I'm in us Texas. here in OKC. That's where I am. I am in Texas. <laughs> Oklahoma where is, this, is where it's at, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So uh, uh, just as a reminder for the rest of you guys who are watching, uh, we are entirely crowdfunded. There are links in the description if you want to support this ministry. If you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done, you can find links there in the description. Uh, tomorrow, we've got Dr. Craig Keener doing uh, Mark chapter 8. And then uh, we also have a video uh, on Wednesday that we're going to be releasing on the Leviathan spirit. Uh, we're probably and, going to introduce and, some, uh, some pythons and the in python there as well. spirit. I mean, they, they both seem kind of snaky. Maybe they're the same thing. The, we don't the Leviathan and the python spirit. I'm going to talk about those too. Yeah, it's going to so. be an exciting uh, program this week. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce someone who's uh, not, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, new to the show. Uh, Dr. Storms, can you tell us a little about yourself and your ministry? I'll Sam you from the rest of the episode, I promise. Uh, I want to get the You'll PhD on the front him. end. Yes, nice. <laughs> he knows what I mean. Yeah, well, um, I'm lead pastor of Preaching and Vision here at Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City, at least for another eight months. Uh, and then uh, there's a usurper in town who's going <laughs> to <laughs> nudge me off of the throne and out of the pulpit and just take over. His name is Michael Roundtree. No, seriously. <laughs> I'm just delighted that God has uh, identified my successor here. Uh, so I've been in ministry for about 47, 48 years. I'm going to continue. I'm not really retiring, just repositioning and hope to do a lot more writing and speaking and uh, things like this. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Looking forward to it. And just so glad that Michael is here. And I know he's going to uh, take the baton and or as the British would say, the baton and continue the ministry here. <laughs> I, I am excited to take the baton. <laughs> well, the rest so, of us are thrilled uh, that Bridgeway lets you sh share you with the rest of us because it sounds like you're going to have more time for writing and traveling and uh, doing podcasts. Remnant Radio less... podcast. Yeah, and Remnant Radio, exclusively Remnant Radio podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael, you can start us off, man. Okay, sure. Uh, well, Sam, we're talking about Christian mysticism, and a lot of our viewers are watching right now, and they don't know what is even meant by Christian mysticism. So could you help us peg a definition of Christian mysticism? Yeah, unfortunately, that's not an easy task. It's not like being asked, would you define Presbyterianism or would you define, you know, post-millennialism or something of that sort? Because there are, there are so many variations in mysticism down through history. Uh, if there is one kind of controlling center to the concept of mysticism, it is the emphasis on experiencing the immediate divine presence. And the word that the, the two important words there are experience and immediate. Um, it's not so much an intellectual grasp of truth as it is an experiential sense or awareness or feeling of not so much the mediated uh, presence of God, you know, the, the God's presence that comes to us through the Lord's Supper or through prayer or through the Word of God, but this immediate awareness of the presence of God, the beauty of God, the grace and the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ um, that is transforming. Uh, it, it's so powerful. In most mystics, you'll read about this idea that I feel at one with God, not so much that uh, I am God, although some kind of sometimes cross the line there and, and move in that direction. But this sense of unity and intimacy, heightened 
uh, capacity to feel the affections uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ for me and for his people. So again, I'm kind of rambling there, but uh, it's all built around this notion of the immediate or direct presence of God that is a felt reality um, that's very transformative, more so than just a thought or intellectual reality. Uh, Sam, can you give us maybe a couple of examples of uh, Christian mystics throughout the ages? Uh, and maybe not broadly, maybe it would be helpful to distinguish. Uh, this would be a mystic I think would you could read. You would eat the meat and spit out the bones, and that's a mystic that you might not want to read. Uh, I don't know if you want to make that distinction as you go, but who would be the mystics throughout church history? Well, there are quite a few. Most most of them, um, as people would imagine, um, come from the medieval period. Um, probably the most famous mystic is Teresa of Avila. And Teresa was actually a, um, a contemporary of the Protestant reformers. So she lived, I think she was born uh, about six or seven years after Calvin was. Um, so she was more in the time of the Protestant Reformation, but most of them predate the Protestant Reformation. Um, there are individuals like uh, some interesting names. Uh, Dionysius the Areopagite uh, is one example. Uh, John Cassian, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, very familiar individual because he introduced the concept of what they call bridal mysticism, uh, where the focus is on uh, what it means to be the bride of Christ and the, devil, the, the depths and the level of intimacy that come from that. Uh, unfortunately, there have been some in the present day who've taken that to an extreme and they've eroticized our relationship with Christ. Uh, they, they tend to use um, marital and even sexual terminology to describe the spiritual love relationship between the believer and the Lord. Um, maybe the most infamous, I, famous, infamous, uh, probably infamous mystic was a man by the name of Meister Eckhart. He died in 1327. Uh, the reason why he is so well known is because he talked about this, this union with God that was of such a nature that it almost blurred the distinction between creator and creature. Um, it, it was almost um, uh, a merging of the two in which we lose our personal identity because it's so absorbed in the identity of God himself. Um, so again, there's others. There's uh, St. John of the Cross. People may not have heard of him. He was a contemporary of Teresa. Um, but he's famous for having popularized the notion of the, the dark night of the soul. So mystics would even talk about those times when they couldn't feel the presence of God. Uh, they couldn't feel his love. And uh, it would last for a certain season. And he called it the dark night of the soul. So those are some of the more familiar mystics. Um, I think St. Teresa, uh, Julian of Norwich is another that I should mention. When I, uh, when I taught theology at Wheaton and I taught the church history class, I would oftentimes have them read uh, Julian and her, uh, the way she described her identification with Jesus, even to the point of feeling what he felt when he was nailed to the cross. Um, so these are just some of the mystics um, that are the most popular in the history of the church. Sam, I'm just curious, what actually made you interested? I know you've studied this extensively. What made you interested in studying mysticism? I guess, um, well, I was, I was first introduced to the mystics when I was in Kansas City, working with Mike Bickle. And Mike was always intrigued by the medieval mystics, and he read extensively in it. And that kind of sparked my interest. And then when I began teaching courses at uh, even a graduate level in church history, there's just simply no way you can ignore them. And they were highly influential in that, uh, that period, really from about 600 up to about 1600, that thousand year span. And one of the reasons why I found them so intriguing is because of the way they uh, stood to some degree in opposition to the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic Church, as you know, essentially says that grace is mediated to us through the ordained clergy, through the seven sacraments. Um, and this idea that somehow you can have immediate uh, access into the presence of God, immediate access to the forgiving grace of God and the empowering presence of the Spirit, 
was very foreign and very antithetical to the Roman Catholic Church. And so in studying, you know, how Roman Catholicism developed in the late medieval period that evoked the Reformation, there's no way to avoid the mystics. Mm -hmm. There's another reason. I I like a lot of what they say. Um, (laughs) I resonate with them. Um, I, I, I hear them talk about their capacity to feel the intimacy with the Lord. And I say, I want that. Now, I don't necessarily buy into all of their uh, theology and some of the underpinnings and the ways in which they pursue that. But, you know, I was, before we came on the air, I just looked at a couple of texts of scripture. And I think, for example, of some of the words of Jesus uh, in John 14, where he talks about, um, uh, in that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. I mean, this abiding presence of the Father and the Son in us and us in him. Uh, so many statements to this effect. Um, Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's no way you can get around kind of the mystical dimensions of this kind of language. Um, sadly, uh, you know, I, I very much um, believe in the, the intellectual dimension of Christian living. We have to have our minds renewed and filled with truth. But sometimes we allow that to eclipse the affections and uh, the reality of, of what Paul prayed, for example, in Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. So bottom line is um, I really am intrigued by what many of the mystics said. Um, Some of them went a little too far, but um, if if I could only taste a small measure of what they experienced in this awareness of God's reality and this sense of closeness and unity, I can't imagine that any Christian would be opposed to that. Uh, Maybe some are, maybe they're just scared of it, but that's probably the the most in, uh, significant contributing factor as to why I began to read so broadly in them. I read mostly in Julian. I read St. Teresa, um, read a lot of, of, of Master Eckhart, even though I think he went too far, St. John of the Cross. Um, you know, Teresa's book, Interior Castle, is fascinating. Mm-hmm. She portrays the human soul as if it's a castle with seven dwelling places. And the journey of the mystic it takes you deeper and deeper into each room until you find yourself in the interior castle where you are at that heightened state of what she calls spiritual ecstasy. Now, again, I know that sounds weird, spiritual ecstasy. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe one of you guys would want to unpack what that means. I, I'd probably get myself in trouble if I did. Uh, we'll let Josh do it. Well, uh, I don't know that I want to unpack it. Uh, I, I would say that there does seem to be in Ephesians 3 uh, a breadth, length, depth, height of the love of God. There's measurable portions of God's love. And then there's a love that surpasses knowledge, but it's a knowing. He wants you to know a, a knowledge that surpasses knowledge, some kind of experiential love of God. And and as I read the mystics, I see them gleaning from this sort of language. Um, they speak a lot about love. They speak a lot about being lost in God's love and his presence. And um, it, it's something also that I, I would say that I, I very much resonate with. Um, I think it's a lot, it's kind of spooky to me in that it's the first time I'm going through these writings myself and reading them. Uh, Cloud of Unknowing, um, the the Dark Night of the Soul, uh, Teresa's work. There's a, a book that was recommended to me. Um, that I started reading through. It was a Roman Catholic guy um, had had written it, and it's just it's all very new to me. Um, but I'll tell you that there are parts parts of it that I really resonate with. Before we, we start diving into some of the practices of some of these mystics, maybe we can unpack some of their theology for a moment. Mm-hmm. Sam, can you explain to us what um, the ineffable nature of God is and why ineffableness, if you will, is so important to mystic theology? Yeah, we probably ought to define our terms here. Ineffability basically means uh, transcending the capacity of the human mind and mouth to articulate. In other words, unspeakable. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 8, a joy unspeakable and full of glory, a joy that, you know, when you try to put words to it, you just don't have words for it. Uh, that's ineffable. Um, 
I think why it's important is because, yes, we, God wants us to know who he is and what he's like. But we have to be careful to think that we've ever been able to reduce him to theological definitions, that we have somehow been able to confine him within parameters of, uh, of, of what it means to speak the word God. He transcends the human mind. Um, you know, I was preaching yesterday. Michael was present, Romans 11, 33 to 36. The judgments of God are unsearchable. His ways are inscrutable. Who has understood the mind of the Lord? Um, so there are dimensions. After all, God is infinite. There are dimensions to God's being that we can't, we can't fathom. And Josh, you mentioned that prayer in Ephesians 3. Um, that is, that's, that's a really profound that Paul would talk about knowing something that is unknowable. What in the mm -hmm. world does that mean? Well, he's obviously saying, I want you to, to experience a reality that transcends your capacity to uh, put boundaries around and define it so that you can limit it and control it. So this ineffable nature of God. In fact, you know, one part of uh, mysticism, and even this is also true in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, and I know you all have done episodes on this before, is this idea of apophatic theology, which is we know God in, a, in, in accordance with what isn't true of him, rather than simply by positive affirmations of what is true. Um, you know, he is infinite, meaning he's without limit. Uh, he's incomprehensible in the sense that he can't be fully and exhaustively known. So this is the, this is the element in mysticism that um, it is intriguing. You know, Josh, you mentioned, maybe you didn't want to comment on this, the cloud of unknowing. Yeah. Um, I, I confess I'm, I'm a little baffled um, when, when some of the mystics say that the one thing we know about God is that he's unknowable. Well, guess what? You just articulated one thing you know about him, namely that he's unknowable. There you go. And if you know that about him, maybe you can know more about him. Um, but that's kind of what ineffability is all about. Yeah, it's like, it's like saying uh, there's no such thing as absolute statements. It's like, is that right. statement absolutely true? <laughs> Uh, and it yeah. gets into this weird space where we, I think we have to divide the communicable and communicable and, and hang out in this cataphatic apophatic space where we can speak apophatically about things that we know to be true. Like, like the Trinity, um, it's really helpful to think about the Trinity and we wrote these creeds that say, well, God, he's not um, one person that shows up in, as a father and shows up as a spirit and shows up as the son. Uh, but no, we believe in one essence and three persons. So, so we're creating these like, not this and not this and not this. And then we go, it's the Trinity. And then people go, well, what's that? And we're like, eh, not sure. Uh, there's something unknowable about three persons and one nature. We don't quite comprehend what it is. So I think as I read like the cloud of unknowing and the great emphasis on cataphatic theology, I'm sorry, apophatic theology, which is the negative statements, but the area that I find um, that I can't go that far with it is that I do think that God has made himself known. Like eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent, John 17, 3. Um, so this idea that God is knowable is very important, but then to allow awe to take over, I think that when we, we, we put God in this very tight um, container of we know all of these little data points about God, then there's no awe and wonder left. And I do think that the mystic tradition, the ineffable nature of God, and cataphatic theology does rightly exalt, I think if, if intention properly, uh, can rightly exalt the awe and wonder and splendor of who God is. Um, I, I feel like yeah. you need to comment on that. I don't know if I, if I, I just monologued there. He's like, Josh, Find you might want to comment. In there. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Okay, well, I, I, can, uh, I can chime in. I, you know, one of the things you both talked about the prayer of Ephesians 3, that you may know the love that surpasses all knowledge. And I love that. Now, we have a revelation of God's love, the greatest revelation of God's love imaginable in the cross, right? And, and so the idea that God is unknowable, while true, you have Deuteronomy 29, 29, uh, that the you know, that the secrets belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and our children. Well, what has God revealed? He's revealed his love to us in Christ the Son. 
however, that love is infinite. And that's what Paul is exploring, the, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ mm -hmm. in Ephesians chapter 3. It's we, we know this love, but we're getting to know it more. So uh, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at is um, I don't know what I'm getting at. I'm just kind of following in line <laughs> with you, Josh. <laughs> I'm just making statements. But uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand. It's a slippery slope, Michael. It's a slippery slope. I'll tell you what. It is. I'm trying let me, to. Let me, let me jump in here, Michael. Yeah, um, why don't you? I, I think, and and the I, the first time, I, the first place I ever saw this was in D.A. Carson's book on the prayers of Paul. And nobody would mistake D.A. Carson for a mystic. I mean, he is an incredible Christian with a great relationship with the Lord, but what an incredible mind, one of the great intellects of the evangelical world. And yet Don said in that prayer, Paul has to be talking about experience. He has to be talking about what we can feel. If he's talking about knowing something that is beyond knowing, he mm -hmm. must be talking about the, uh, the capacity to feel the affection that God has for us in Jesus. Now, again, yeah. I know a lot of Christians are terrified of their feelings because they're so susceptible to uh, misleading us and they're fleeting. But that doesn't mean they aren't real and that God doesn't intend for us to experience the love that he has for us. Um, so I think that, that that prayer, Paul is saying, um, the height, the depth, the width, and the breadth of something that surpasses knowledge, I want you to feel the reality of it. You know, our good friend and mentor, Jack Beer, often talks about how God wants us to feel his affection for us. And I think that's what that's part of the mystical tradition. Now, sometimes they take it a little bit too far, but that is certainly one dimension of it. Um, here's, here's another one. Um, Josh, you asked about the theology of the mystics. All of them focus to, to one degree or another on this idea of union with Christ, union with God. And I think that many times we evangelical Protestants miss out on a dimension of what that entails. We think of it in terms of my position. You know, Paul uses this phrase in Christ so many times, dozens and dozens of times. And when people say, well, what does that mean to be in Christ? And usually we define that as, well, uh, in the sight of God, I'm justified. Uh, that's my position, my standing. I think there may be, I'm not denying that. I think that's certainly true. I think there's more to it than that. I think there is this sense of my life is in him and his life is in me. I mean, in Romans 8, I was just reading a moment ago here um, where, where Paul talks about, um, it, it talks about not only that um, the Spirit is in us, but we are in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. This mutual indwelling, this uniting of our hearts one with another, this capacity not only to intellectually understand the, the reality of God's love, but actually our affections are awakened and we feel it. You know, like in 1 Peter 1, 8, joy inexpressible and full of glory. Yeah, I think of 2 mm -hmm. Peter uh, 1, you know, 3 through 4, right? We're partakers of that divine nature. Um, that there is something that the mystics will hammer on uh, is this kind of doctrine of theosis. They'll touch on this kind of deification and that, that word may be odd for some. I'd really encourage you guys to go check out the many podcasts we've done on theosis from people from various traditions, uh, Lutherans, uh, uh, Dr. Jordan Cooper, uh, president of the uh, AALC Lutheran Seminary. Um, we had uh, recently uh, Michael uh, Reardon came on the show and did uh, an episode with us as well. And <clears throat> we've also had Dr. Michael Heiser come on and talk about theosis. And I don't know that we should unpack theosis that much in this episode, um, I'm curious about some of the practices as we're almost halfway through as it flies mm -hmm. by. Um, Teresa uh, talks about like infused prayer. Um, can you maybe unpack a little bit for us what infused prayer, we talk about experiences and experiencing the love of God, what that actually looks like and, and what she's talking about there? Infused prayer. Yeah, infused Sounds prayer. Like you said Sound like you said confused prayer. Uh, well, I mean, it could <laughs> Are they be the either. Same? I mean, it depends <laughs> on your take on on her view of prayer. Yeah. Um, she uses language, again, that scares a lot of people. She talks about ecstasy. She talks about being so caught up in this communion with God, this communication, 
hearing his voice speaking to him, this, this, this notion of prayer, that there's a loss of a sense of one's surroundings, <clears throat> that the bodily sensations, the physical dimension of life is eclipsed because there's such an intense awareness of being of one mind and one heart, one spirit with God. Um, she says that there's one place I, I wrote it down. She says, when the body is in rapture, it is as though dead. Um, mm. because she's oblivious to anything else that's going on around her. She says, this doesn't last very long. These are momentary incidents. She said, rarely has she had one that lasted beyond an hour. Um, but I think that's a little bit of what she has in mind. Um, again, this is the key to almost all mystics, this idea that God directly can invade and infuse us with an awareness of his presence and of his love apart from the what we might call the normal means of grace. And that's why they were always on the outs, as it were, with the Roman Catholic tradition and Roman Catholic practices. Um, so again, Teresa is very careful not to blur the distinction between uh, God and humanity. Um, so emphasizing this oneness, it's an experiential oneness. It's not a metaphysical oneness. And I know you all addressed that when you talked about theosis. Right. Uh, just so, something that just came to mind also that, uh, Michael, you kind of asked the question about, um, about, you know, I don't know if you did, maybe I'm just making something up here. Uh, I'm in a state of spiritual ecstasy, so I'm a little bit confused. Forgive me if I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, almost all the mystics emphasize visionary experiences, um, hearing the voice of God. So many of them claimed it to hear it audibly, um, seeing things in the spirit, um, biblical truths, theological concepts, taking on a very tangible uh, reality in their lives. And because of this, they've been largely dismissed by mainstream evangelicals, especially cessationists. They said, look, these people are deluded. Spirit of God doesn't speak except through scripture. So this claim that somehow they had visions of Christ on the cross. And of course, many of them being Roman Catholic, visions of the Virgin Mary um, or other uh, kind of supernatural revelatory experiences is one of the reasons why they are marginalized, especially among um, cessationist evangelicals. Well, uh, let's talk about that because it seems like there are a lot of connections between charismatics and mystics throughout church history. Uh, there's visions and hearing the voice of God, uh, strong emphasis on prayer. Uh, if you read the mystics, they'll talk about spiritual inebriation and emphasis on experience. And on the negative side, uh, uh, perhaps an emphasis on anti-intellectualism. So mm -hmm. talk to us about the connection between the modern charismatic movement and mysticism as it's been practiced throughout church history. Yeah, I think the the one of the key phrases used there was anti intellectualism. I don't I don't I don't want to categorize all mystics as saying they're anti intellectual. These were some smart people. <laughs> you just read their writings. You can see these are very intelligent individuals, uh, many of whom were very well educated. Um, but the the evangelical world as a whole, as you all know, particularly the cessationist family or, or wing within that family is very suspicious of excessive emphasis on emotion, feeling, affections. Um, they are so rigidly confined to the propositional statements in scripture that they are highly suspicious of and largely um, tend to denigrate those who would put any kind of emphasis on feeling. Uh, charismatics, on the other hand, precisely because they have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, they've had revelatory disclosures, they've experienced prophetic words, they witnessed supernatural healings and miracles, they've spoken in tongues. Um, because of these realities, they're far more inclined to give heed to the mystics and to take them seriously more so than mainstream evangelicals. Again, this uh, this tendency to to drive this wedge between word and spirit, and uh, if the mystics gravitated to one over against the other, they would have gravitated to the spirit side. Cessationists gravitate to the word side, 
Uh, I think both of them may have gone a little bit too far and failed to hold both of them together. Now, in saying that, Michael, you, you mentioned it. Uh, they meditated on scripture it, just unendingly. Uh, the Song of mm -hmm. Solomon in particular, um, uh, the Psalms, they were immersed in the word of God. So they weren't anti-word, they weren't anti-mind. They just believed that true Christian living transcends that and also entails a very real experiential transforming encounter with God that, of course, ultimately will consummate in what they call the beatific vision. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sam, I've got, I've got some quotes in here uh, that I just want to read, and then I want to kind of get some of your thoughts. I'm going to have a question behind these quotes. Uh, this one's from Teresa. Uh, she says, I still want to describe this prayer uh, of quiet to you. She talks about a prayer of quiet. What does it mean to pray without praying, right? Um, so she says that uh, I'll describe it in the way that I've heard it explained and as the Lord has been pleased to teach it to me. This is a supernatural state, and however hard we try, we cannot acquire it by ourselves. Um, the faculties are stilled, have no wish to move, for any movement uh, they make seems to hinder the soul from loving God. Uh, they are not completely lost, however, since uh, two uh, of them are free, and they can realize in whose presence they are, uh, it, is, uh, it is the will uh, that is captive now. The intellect tries to occupy itself with only one thing, and the memory has no desire to busy itself with more. Uh, they, they both see uh, that this is one thing necessary. Anything else will cause them to be disturbed. So this is Teresa. She's talking about an experience where it, it's like she, you lay still, and the God's presence is over you, and your mind is so occupied in a, a moment of transcendent love, ecstasy, if you will. And I, I've had experiences like this and it's the reason i've been trying to consume these mystics for the last couple of weeks is it's because they make sense to some of my story and I, i'm trying to find some historicity to this and i go what the heck is that like why why would god cause a presence to come upon us that we're not thinking we're not learning we're experiencing god like like what does that do is that is that supposed to be sanctifying is that supposed to edify us is that supposed to edify the body of christ externally is it an empowerment like why, why would God do this? And, and if he, if this is God, um, why isn't this seen in scripture? Like, why don't I see, you know, you know, pray until you can't move and God's presence, you know, overwhelms you in some kind of spiritual ecstasy. Like that would be a really great verse, um, to justify this kind of experience. Maybe, maybe help me out with this. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the, the mystic would say, "Stop trying to make sense of it, Josh. Just enjoy it. <laughs> just, just enter the cloud I'm of so unknown." I'm so Protestant. I'm so, I just can't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I know what you're saying because I've had on multiple occasions this same kind of experience. Um, in fact, I had a little bit of it yesterday during our time of worship uh, after we had unpacked Romans 11:33 to 36 for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever and ever. And suddenly, um, you know, I'm just caught up in the reality of the incredible, indescribable glory of God. And the fact that I get to experience that and I'm going to see it, you know, the beatific vision. Amen. And, um, you know, there are times when that happens that I become somewhat detached from my surroundings. It's not like I fall into a trance, but it is, profoundly satisfying. Mm -hmm. It is that, um, that, that Psalm 1611, that pleasures forevermore, that fullness of joy, that being satisfied as with richness uh, that we read about uh, in, in the Psalms. Um, so again, you, my, my pushback to you would be, because I don't think you meant to say this, I don't think you would conclude that nothing good came of that. No, as if you no, weren't, no weren't increasingly in love with the Lord and maybe even made more hungry. Like, Lord, if this is what it's like now, uh, how much more is there awaiting me in this life and especially in the life to come? So, Oh yeah. Um, I'm, I, I'm ruined from the experience. Like I'm, I'm I, like th these kinds of things cause me to be just completely undone. Like I don't, I don't know what to do with myself because part of me never wants to experience the kind of earth shattering encounters that I've had. But then the other part of me wants to like seek them all the more. 
So, yeah. you know, but then to explain that to someone where that's completely foreign to them without a proof text, like trying to explain to Protestants, like why, why being lost in spiritual ecstasy is beneficial for the body. It's like, uh, yeah. it's kind of hard. The, the first time, I think it's probably the first time I ever had this happen to me was in October of 1970 when the Lord grant, gave me the gift of tongues. And I've tried to describe it to people. And again, it's one of those things that you you have a, you struggle to put words to it. I, I, I've often said it felt as if the veil between heaven and earth was pulled back. And that's the only way I know how to put it because there was this sensory awareness of the power and the presence of the, of the supernatural realm of God himself that had drawn near to me in a way that I'd never known or sensed or felt before. It was empowering. It was exhilarating. I don't live each day. I mean, I haven't had a two dozen of those, but that was the first time it happened. Right, right. And it, it was in the midst of that, that God granted me the, the capacity to pray in, in my heavenly language. Um, there are times during worship when I will be praying in tongues that the same thing happens. Um, again, I know that that scares a lot of evangelicals. They think oh, if you're open to that, you're susceptible to that. What's to keep a demon from entering in and kind of distorting it and leading you down the wrong path? Or uh, what's to prevent you from embracing heretical doctrines? And of course, none of us would ever suggest that any experience that in any way uh, counters what scripture teaches us in terms of truth is legitimate. We know that that is not of God. God would never lead us down that path. So I don't know if, if you all have had these kinds of encounters, how you would account for them, what you would say of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had these kinds of encounters, but when I've had them, I've always been seeking God in some way. I've uh, I've been praying, I've been worshiping, I've been reading his word, maybe it was on a long fast. There, there's been some sort of usually spiritual discipline where I have been in this sort of a uh, position of just receiving and then God in his grace has come and met me uh, in, a, in a powerful encounter. And uh, it's not all the time, but, uh, but sometimes uh, every now and then I've had these radical life-changing encounters. But when you talk about the mystics, Sam, you, you talk about how they directly experience God's presence, his immediate presence, not through prayer, not through the sacraments, not through the ordinary means of grace, uh, but rather they just experience him directly. Can you unpack that for us? Because I, I hear them too, They, you know, the term contemplative prayer, and that seems to be a means by which they would experience God. But, but I mean, what exactly were they doing when they had these encounters? Because it seems like they were doing something. Well, they spend a lot of time in solitude. They would spend a lot of time in meditation. Um, they would um, they would obviously oftentimes spend a lot of time in prayer and in praise. But but here's here's one statement that I wrote down is trying to trying to encapsulate an answer to that. So let see if this makes sense. Uh, the true experience of God's presence and love is not something attainable by utilizing human reasoning like observation, deduction, inference, implication, any form of intellectually based proofs. Rather, it is by a direct infusion from God himself that engages the spiritual rather than the mental center of the individual. Um, most mystics would identify with that. They would say that, you know, they would oftentimes give instructions on how you might be able to elicit this kind of experience but they would oftentimes also say it's ultimately a sovereign act of God. He has to be the one to uh, impart or to infuse this um, suprasensory feeling and encounter with the divine that ultimately cannot be put in human words or in propositional statements. I'd like to uh, th lob another quote at you and get your, your thoughts on it. This one kind of touches on the theosis idea um, of being in this life 
um, partaking in these divine attributes, these divine natures, uh, in a way that deifies us so that we can have greater levels of union with him. I think you've already mentioned that uh, Calvin and others will make union with Christ uh, by faith and faith alone. Here's a quote from uh, St. John of the Cross uh, that I'd like your thoughts on. He said, These two extremes, the soul and divine wisdom, may be united. They will have to come to accord by means of certain likeness. So for divine wisdom and the, the human soul to unite, they have to be they have to be unified. They have to look the same somehow. As a result, the soul must also be pure and simple, uh, uh, unlimited and unattached to any particular knowledge and unmodified by the boundaries of form, space, and image. Since God cannot be encompassed uh, by an image, form, or particular knowledge, in order to be united with him, the soul should not be limited by particular form of uh, a particular form or knowledge. So this is this kind of sounds like meditation to me, like the Eastern weird kind, like where we empty our mind. We want to have it void of knowledge. We want to have void of image, self-awareness, like complete, complete emptiness so that we can be united with God who, because he is ineffable, can't be contained in an image or a knowledge. Um, so, so can you speak into that for a moment? Would that be a, a, helpful, a helpful or an unhelpful distinction from St. John of the Cross? I have to say it's probably unhelpful. I'm with um, you. It's true that God cannot be contained by words, but he has chosen to communicate himself and his presence and power to us through propositional statements. Um, here's where probably I would differ from the mystics in a very significant way. In most instances, when I am feeling close to God, I'm feeling his immediate presence, his manifest presence. I'm sensing with a heightened awareness the love that he has for me in Christ. It comes from my meditation on scripture. It comes from me thinking about Paul's statement in Romans 5, um, about the love of God has been poured out of my heart through the Holy Spirit has been given to me, and how while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When I stop and I meditate on that statement, Romans 8, 1, and I, and I think about what does that mean? No condemnation. Um, being in Christ Jesus, it's through those inspired and infallible words that came ultimately from the Spirit of God, that the Spirit works in me a sensible awareness of God in a way that I might not ordinarily experience when I'm just going through my ordinary responsibilities in the course of a day. So I I just simply, I have a hard time separating word from spirit. I have a hard time separate. And, and again, I have to go back to Ephesians 3. Yeah, there is a, there is a knowing that trans, that, that is, you're knowing something that transcends knowledge. You can't reduce it to propositional categories, but that doesn't mean that the propositional categories can't be a conduit through which we you enter into deeper union with God, greater gratitude, greater awareness of his love and his beauty and his majesty. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, but... it, absolutely, it absolutely does. Uh, there's actually another quote by Athanasius on the Incarnation. He, he has a quote that I think perfectly uh, yes and amens what you're saying. He says, by nature, of course, man is mortal since he is made from nothing. Uh, but as he bears the likeness of him uh, who is and is, uh, if he prevails that likeness, uh, if he yet preserves that likeness through constant uh, com contemplation, then his nature is deprived of its power and remains incorrupt. He goes on to quote Psalm 82, I say that you are gods. Again, it's a, a classic theosis space. But then he says a, a specific phrase um, that we are partakers of this nature by God's grace through his word, right? So he's saying that this is not an act of our doing in contemplation. It's an act of that mediated grace that comes from God's word. Um, that's uh, mm -hmm. Athanasius on the incarnation. So just to say yes and amen to what you're saying, and I would more heartily agree with you and Athanasius than uh, uh, St. John of the Cross on this one. Uh, Michael, you had a question in there? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, Josh, you you brought up the, it, the similarities to Eastern mysticism, possibly. You asked a question about that. Uh, in terms of process, the emptying of the mind, 
but there could be another connection to Eastern mysticism. Uh, some of the mystics will talk about uh, just sort of completely losing yourself uh, in oneness with God and to the point where it almost seems like there's maybe a loss of distinction. And uh, of course, it, it almost sounds like reaching a state of nirvana sounds like in Hinduism becoming like a drop in the ocean of Brahman and just sort of becoming nothing because God becomes all in all. Uh, it, do you see some of that in the mystics, Sam? And is that sort of like the fringe mystics and the vast majority of them don't go there? Just kind of talk into that space a little bit. Yeah, I, I do think the fringe mystics, the more extreme expressions like Meister Eckhart would go in that direction. But, you know, the, there are new, uh, let me give you, you know, a very famous text. Everybody knows Galatians 2.20. Listen to how Paul describes this. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. So somebody might stop right there and say, well, see, there's the loss of any sense of self-identity. Well, keep going. I die, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's a profoundly spiritual, almost mystical concept that, that there's another being who's different from me, who lives in me. And this life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So I'm still living this life, but it's in complete dependence upon in relationship to the Son of God. And then Paul says, who loved me and gave himself for me. So there's still a me, um, this love that he has for me and he gave himself for me. I didn't lose my personal identity. And I think, so Paul's saying, this sense of Christ living in and through me comes from my reflection on the fact of an external objective reality. Something happened outside of me, namely Christ dying on the cross for me. That's the basis on which he now lives in me. So I think you have to, and this is one of the dangers of mysticism, is that they can so focus on the internal subjective reality that they lose sight of the external objective foundation. The only reason why we can experience God's love is because of the love that was shown in the cross of Christ, dying Amen. for individual human beings uh, so Amen. that they might, have Christ live in and through them by faith. So yeah, this there's there's always that danger of crossing the line um, from um, from the sense of personal identity into this sense of such uh, um, an what I want to say an indistinguishable union that we lose sight of the fact that God loves individual sinners and I happen to be one of them and I always will be, and I will always be other than God and he will be always other than me. Uh, and yet at the same time, there is a unity of life and in, I dwell in him, he dwells in me. Uh, so there's, there's the inescapable mystical dimension, but it's always rooted in an objective reality of what God has done for us in Christ at a specific point in time and history. Hmm. So you, you mentioned earlier on in the show, pseudo, well, you said Dionysius. I'm going to write the pseudo in front of Dionysius just because we're not exactly sure who this guy is. He's not the right. Dionysius of the Bible. Uh, he's, he's some other guy taking this name. Um, uh, but we don't think anything that he's saying is is harmful or meant to you know hurt anybody. Anyway, all that to say, a lot of people claim that his philosophy is really platonic and then should just be rejected carte blanche. And then this whole mystic tradition that stems from him, cloud of unknowing and all these other things, really, um, because it's deeply platonic in its thought, should be, um, and, and I want to be clear, I mean platonic in the sense that it stems from Plato, not in a romantic sort of relationship. I know we've been talking about Song of Solomon for people who are listening. Um, uh, the, so, so should we get rid of it altogether? Is any of it, can any of it been, be trusted? Oh, I think the part that can be trusted, as we talked about earlier, is the fact that he reminds us that God cannot be reduced to propositional utterances or any particular theological system. And that's true. But um, let me just read you some of the words of Dionysius and you tell me whether this makes sense. 
the divinest knowledge of God, that which is received through unknowing, is obtained in that communion which transcends the mind, when the mind turning away from all things and leaving even itself behind is united to the dazzling rays, being from them and in them illumined by the unsearchable depth of wisdom. I'm not, I'm not real sure I know what that means. Um, <laughs> so knowledge that comes through unknowing, is that just a blatant contradiction in terms? Or is he striving to tell us what Paul prays for in Ephesians 3? Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I want to learn something from him. But at the same time, um, just I realize that uh, I think he probably has crossed a line that is unhelpful. Um, you know, he says, in this experience, a man is plunged into the darkness of unknowing and through the passive stillness of all his reasoning powers is united by his highest faculty to him who is wholly unknowable, of whom thus by a rejection of all knowledge, he possesses a knowledge that exceeds his understanding. So, okay, a rejection of all knowledge, you possess a knowledge that exceeds understanding. I, I'm kind of less speechless. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know that I've ever felt that. Um, I know he's probably overreacting to a, 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 a hyper intellectualized approach, highly institutionalized approach, mechanical approach to Christian living. And he wants to get back to the very essence of feeling and knowing and experiencing the reality of who Christ is in us. Just, I just think he's gone too far in that respect. Huh. Okay. Uh, Sam, you've, you've, uh, read, you said a lot of, uh, Teresa of Avila. So, and, and you talked about the seven mansions. Could you talk to us, just maybe explain a little bit more of what these seven mansions are or represent in terms of, uh, our approach to relating to God? Well, to put it in just, common evangelical language is what she's really talking about is just the stages of spiritual maturity. Um, for example, um, let me, let me give you an example. Second Corinthians three eighteen, which I know you all know by heart, but I'm going to actually read it. So we'll make sure we know what Paul is saying, where he says, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. I think what she's trying to communicate, and this is my Protestant evangelical interpretation of a mystic, is that she's saying that you are being progressively transformed into the likeness of God, into the deeper experience of who he is and what he's done for you from one degree of glory to another. So she would apply that. She would say that's from one room in this in castle into a deeper room. You're going deeper and deeper into the experience of God until you finally reach that stage of perhaps some form of absolute perfection, absolute unity with God in this life. So it's again, it's a progressive movement from a stage of, I don't really know him that well. I'm immature. Uh, I can't sense his presence to a higher stage of spiritual intimacy to a, a even deeper and higher way and capacity of knowing and feeling the affection God has for me to the sheer delight of um, rejoicing in the knowledge that God is mine and I am his. So again, it's her way of putting, I guess, metaphorical language in this image of, of a castle um, and the interior, the deepest room of intimacy let, let, let's put it in modern terms. It's like um, if you come to my house and we stand out in the front yard and we have a conversation as friends, but then I say, hey, why don't you come on in? And we stand on my front porch and we go deeper in conversation. I say, hey, come on in. Let's go sit in the, in, in the TV room and sit down and really go deeper with this. And if I can put it in a marital context, then I would say to my wife, hey, let's go into the bedroom. That's where the greatest expression of love and intimacy is found. So that's the progression, as it were, that Teresa is talking about as we go deeper into our experience of who God is and our capacity to enjoy his enjoyment of us. Does that help explain yeah. what she's saying? Yeah, Super yeah it does. 
Let me uh, okay. ask a few. Hey. If we can do a lightning round, maybe, where we can like run through some of these questions from uh, uh, I, lightning I, round. I, we did that last Michael week. Michael introduced this. It these will be well. quick questions. BJ Allen wants to know, uh, hey, can anyone be a mystic? Uh, like, how do you be a mystic? Or is it like a calling? Is it like, how does, how, how is one a mystic? Is, is, are you called into it? Is it like being a, like John the Baptist when he was uh, called to be a You eat locust. Or something like that. That's yeah, do you go you out do. to the field and eat locust? I, no, no, I don't believe that unique individuals are called to be mystics. I think all Christians are called into a deeper, ever-growing, more intense and intimate relationship with Jesus. Um, now there are steps. I mean, the mystics would say, look, you need to, you need to spend time alone. They called it solitude. They, they emphasize silence. In other words, kind of shut out the distractions of this world, turn off the TV, shut down the internet. Not now. Don't shut it down. Now you'll miss the program. Shut it down. <laughs> stop looking at email. Um, find, get alone with the word of God out in creation in nature and meditate on the greatness. of God. Don't empty your mind. I, we're, Let's be real clear. We're not, as you said earlier, we're not talking about this Eastern approach to meditation in which you uh, empty your mind and allow any any voice, any idea to intrude. That's dangerous. Uh, we're talking about filling your mind with the biblical truth about who God is. Uh, so yes, there are steps you can take. As we all know, they're called spiritual disciplines that would, I think, facilitate and accelerate our capacity to experience what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 3. Okay, That's similar good. question. Uh, do you have, uh, or do we have any current mystics? Are there any mystics out there right now? Maria Carlson. That person's Carlson. mystic. Who are they? This is Maria Carlson's question. Yeah, both of those are Patreon people. They're great friends. Love them. Oh, hey, throwing it out to the Patreon. Uh, the only mystic I know of personally is some guy named Josh Lewis. But No, it's be... garbage. <laughs> no, Tozer, Tozer, uh, you know, I'd say I, Tozer I, was a mystic. He's not still alive, but I think he was. Tozer yeah. loves the mystics. Yeah. Uh, boy, that's a great question. I don't, want, I don't want to label anybody. I mean, I've got some close friends who um, are but probably would tend and lean in that direction. But uh, I don't know that there's anybody out there. Who, I mean, a lot of people out there call themselves Apostle Joe or Apostle whoever, but I don't think they call, Sam. hey, I'm Mystical Mary, I'm Mystical Mark. <laughs> I, I don't know of anybody who uh, uh, That would be fire. Sa Sam, on, on a scale of one to seven mansions, uh, where would you rate your own spirituality? Where am I? <laughs> where are you? I'm in the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> did, did Teresa oh. des describe an outhouse to the marriage? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we um, digress. We digress. So that wasn't that, a real that's question. A, that's Sam, a, a don't profoundly have unfair this. question that I refuse to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, so okay. Okay. Next how do you, question. How do you how do you rank Josh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm with Sam um, in the outhouse. <laughs> I do know this. I do know this in all seriousness. Um, there, I know a lot of people who love Jesus a lot more than I do. And that grieves me, breaks my heart. I do know people who, who are able to testify and you see it tangibly in the way they live, that they have experienced the felt reality of Christ's love for them more than I have. And I just cry. I don't compare myself. I think that's wrong. I don't think we're supposed to compete with others, but it does stir me and, and move me to cry out to the Lord. Lord, I want more of you. Um, I, I want to I want to see you more clearly. I want to understand who you are with greater clarity. Um, so, you know, I will say that. But I, I think any any time we try to compare ourselves or say, hey, I'm in the third uh, room in the uh, heading toward the interior castle and poor soul, you're 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 out there in room six. I mean, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got to avoid that. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, uh, I, I find that that's in the same way that I can read these mystics and go, man, there's a lot of their theology. I just can't get behind. It's kind of weird for me. But when I read their stories, I'm like, this is someone who's been with the Lord. And I think that there's a lot of that right now as well. I look at people and I go, man, I just can't endorse that person's doctrine carte blanche. But when they speak, I know that they've been with Jesus. Um, and and I think that should be something that we aspire to, right? Like that that statement, though we can't 
you know, maybe claim it to its fullness, that which we've seen with our eyes, that we've touched with our hands, we've proclaimed to you, to proclaim a Jesus that we've been with, uh, opposed to one that we've read about in a book. Um, that's a Amen. that's a promise, and that's a it's a kind of a beautiful reality that we get to we get to touch on and and kind of peer into. And I think some of the mystic tradition is helpful in in thinking in that way. Uh, we got to wrap up this show, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. I want to remind you, we're entirely crowdfunded. There's links in the description if you want to support us. But I also want to remind you uh, that we did release an ebook. Uh, let me put that helpful graphic there up on the screen. Links in the description. Uh, you'll see that the book is called Though Man May Not Perceive It. That's a quote from Job uh, talking about the ways that God speaks. Uh, he speaks in a couple different ways, and, and sometimes we don't hear him speak. So if you guys are interested in learning how to understand the voice of God and the various ways that God communicates, that there's a link for that in the description as well. Uh, so, yeah. uh, Hey, Josh, I'm yes, going to interrupt you. Please do. We gotta let we gotta let Sam promo his book. Sam, he oh. came out with a book like uh, two weeks ago. What's it called? Just cranking out books. Well... What did God do with my sin, Sam? Tell me. It's called A Dozen Things God Did With Your Sin and Three Things He'll Never Do. In fact, before I came on with you guys, I did an hour-long uh, radio interview uh, on this book. It uh, Crossway published it. I'm really excited about it. Uh, so maybe we can even do a program sometime on it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah and, and okay. I'm going to also plug Sam's other books because we're book peddlers. That's what we do. Um, understanding Spiritual Gifts. Understanding spiritual warfare, both phenomenal books. You should pick them up. Uh, Sam's got way more than that. I just, those are the two that I had on my shelf that I could see from here. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> Michael, did you have any closing thoughts, man? Uh, well, I, I think just experience God, seek Him, pray, worship, be in His presence, and just just make space to encounter Him. And, uh, and I think, I don't think it's some sort of like, uh, magical formula that gets you there. I just think that if you make a life of friendship with God and you seek him every day, mm -hmm. sometimes you're going to have some really radical experiences. But, it, you know, honest, honestly, I'm not like just living for like the in-between radical experiences, waiting for the very next one and, and like in-between like life sucks. It's, you know, God is in the ordinary and God is in mm -hmm. the extraordinary. And I experience him in different ways in both. And it's it's beautiful the whole way through. So just just seek God is really it. Amen. And for all that that talk of promoting books, uh, Sam has an older book called Pleasures Forevermore, which is probably right in line with this conversation. So if you wanted to pick up something from him on kind of something in this space, that'd be a good one as well. Uh, anyways, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. Uh, make sure to hit the like button if you enjoyed the content. Hit the subscribe button so you're notified when we come out with content like this. And be looking forward to tomorrow where we're coming out with an episode with Dr. Craig Keener on the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 8. Uh, we're going to do Leviathan Spirit and some kind of, what is that other one? Python. Cobra Kai Spirit. Python Spirit. The, and then, the Cobra Kai. <laughs> the Cobra Kai Spirit. And then uh, we're doing an, another short video we're releasing. Like, why, why get charismatics empty out children's hospitals? That's always a question I'm getting. And I'm going to be answering that question uh, on Thursday. So, you guys, I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Blessings.